independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. Craig Collins with you, filling in for Chad Benson today. Chad will be back next week. I'm thrilled to be hanging out. Uh, Thrilled to be a part of the show and happy almost July 4th to everyone out there. Hopefully July 4th never gets recommended as a change for any kind of holiday as they debate other holidays and what we should, shouldn't change. Uh, Let's start with the president of the United States. How about that? Uh, Let's talk to, uh, while he spoke with, uh, he did a couple interviews yesterday and he spoke about masks. He spoke about polling numbers, a lot going on. Um, You know, what's most interesting to me though, as the president talks about different polling numbers, as the president talks about how he's doing in relation to a Joe Biden, is the simple fact that Joe is doing so well, and yet, according to polls, I should say, and even, I guess, his funding, uh, apparently for the second month in a row, the Biden campaign has done fairly well in raising funds. All of this has happened while Joe Biden's policy for how he, he campaigns is to be as distant as possible, to, to speak as little as possible, to be as away as hidden in the world as he can be. And he even said, I think, in his one press conference he's done now in the last uh, few months that he's going to follow the doctor's orders, stay out of the the spotlight, essentially, uh, and not do a lot of public things, not campaign at all. And that's benefited him. It's sort of surreal, right? Like all the things that we'll see throughout the year, uh, one of the most surreal ones will be this presidential campaign by both uh, the current president, Donald Trump, and by Joe Biden. Uh, But the most interesting thing to me is that if Joe doesn't speak, doesn't do interviews, doesn't have conversations, he's likely to do better than if he starts being a more public uh, presence. But let's talk about those poll numbers. The president asked about this uh, yesterday in an interview. Here was his response. I was there in 2016 when I saw the polls doing kind of what they're doing right now, sir, where early, you know, in the last oh, year. much worse. Well, they, yeah, they, weren't, yeah. they didn't look good. They had Hillary Clinton yeah, beating they, you. They weren't looking too good, I guess. Is there a fair poll out there? Uh, there are. And we have some really good ones, and we've gotten some really good polls. But I had the same thing in 16. I got numbers. I was 14, 15 points down in some polls in front of the last election. And then I won. Now, I think we did come up a lot of the last week, but we didn't come up numbers like that. Uh, We won. It's the fake polls. I call them fake polls. They're suppression polls. They're meant to dampen the enthusiasm of your voters, of your people, because we have tremendous enthusiasm. You know, we're up. Uh, I like the fact that first he he talks about uh, a bunch of the different numbers that he's seen before in 2016 and now. And now, of course, he he feels that a lot of these polls have an actual de- desire. They they want to convince you of something that may or may not be legitimate. I want to play more of this interview, though, uh, because I, I did start to laugh at some of the ways in which he, he addresses what he's seeing internally as the things that are are much better than what you and I are hearing about on the everyday TV stations, the, the news as it's covered on most of the talking head places, <laughs> he mentions enthusiasm numbers. And then he starts talking about bikers for Trump, uh, which is a nice shout out. I'm not sure exactly if this is as much proof of, of the popularity of the president as he thinks it is. Uh, but I was amused by these answers. So here we 30 go. 30 points in enthusiasm. That's a very important word. In enthusiasm over Biden. Take a look at, the, at boating. There's thousands of boats all over the place. Trump, Trump. We love Trump. Uh motorcycles you look at uh you look at all of the motorcycles they're all over the highways with the bikers for trump we have a group bikers for trump they're incredible people and they're all over the place they have many groups actually but one of them is bikers for trump i just love the drop i love the fact that he mentions that because uh if if you weren't aware there is an organization bikers for trump they do drive around highways and, and their communities um, supporting the president. And it's it's one of the ways in which he knows he's doing way better than people think he might be doing right now. And the polls, all of them, every single poll you read right now says Biden is ahead uh, by a, a substantial amount. Actually, it is true to say a higher amount than Hillary Clinton was leading him by uh, years ago. But I, I'm going to continue to say this as far as the reason that I think that's going on. The easiest and the the first reaction to it is Joe Biden's been nowhere. He's been pretty much uh, on his own and and hiding from as many of the conversations as he probably should be having, as as usually are had by people in a position like his, people running for president and obviously the nominee for their their side of the aisle. The fact that he's so distant from any of that stuff is is telling, in my opinion, as to how interested he is in in being more vocal. And the president is dealing with several very challenging issues at the same time. So anyone that reacts to anyone asked, especially if you're someone who 
didn't support him in the first place. The odds of you saying something nice about the president right now with all the challenges we face just in general, not necessarily the responses he's had to those challenges, but just the fact that they exist, that unemployment is as high as it is, uh, that we're, we're seeing coronavirus spike back up in certain areas. All of these things would make it very difficult for anyone to to be doing exceptionally well as far as the public feelings on on your current president in a time when things are so, so challenging. So that's that's my opinion on all this. As I, as I see this continue to play out, as I see these conversations continue to take place as as to who is likely to win now, which, by the way, it's way too early. And they've not they haven't had a single debate yet. Uh, and I know that uh, Biden, I think, in his press conference he gave the other day, said that he's willing to have the exact number of debates as they usually have. The Trump campaign had asked for more. Uh, that's not going to happen. I think Biden would prefer to do less than the typical three that uh, that we're all expecting. And I can't wait to see the numbers after there is a debate between those two individuals. And I've actually seen this, too. Uh, this is something I noticed. Uh, well, I, I know a lot of us noticed it throughout, but I think there's been polls recently asking how many voters are concerned about the mental health of Joe Biden, legitimately concerned about it. And 20 percent of Democrats think there might be a problem. Certainly more Republicans think there might be a problem. But it's surreal to me that 20 percent of Democrats are saying we also feel as though maybe he's not up for this health wise. How could you possibly vote for someone if you think that mentally they have an illness? And I would feel terrible if that were true. And I don't I don't think it's true. I still think that Joe is the same guy. I remember him being as a politician, a guy who's not good at navigating most conversations, if not reading from a piece of paper the entire time. That's just not his his forte, which is weird. And it's usually not beneficial to to run for president when you can't speak uh, for more than, I don't know, 30 seconds. Uh, but that's that's the world in which we live right now. And that's who this guy is. So we'll we'll see how that all that goes. But if if he actually is ill, I, I beg whoever's aware of that to ask him to step down for his own sake, because it would be tremendously difficult on your human being on your on yourself to have to go through something like run for president, one of the most stressful things that you could possibly do, certainly in politics, and be dealing with something as serious as, as dementia, if that's what it is. But 20 percent of Democrats who answered a recent poll said, yeah, they think maybe Joe Biden has dementia. And yet I think they're still probably planning on voting for him. That to me makes absolutely no sense uh, here. Real quick, I also want to cover one other thing that the president said during that interview he gave. He talked about uh, masks. Uh, this was just the other day. And obviously, people have a lot of feelings as to what President Trump thinks is appropriate uh, as far as masks are concerned. And I know there's been a lot of things in the news. He visits places. People ask him a bunch of times, you're going to wear a mask, you're going to wear a mask. He kind of says no. Um, and then there's photos of him wearing a mask that maybe he didn't want to be out there. Uh, but this is maybe more a reflection, in my opinion, of how the president is protected by the people around him, how many tests are done by all those around him, more so than his desire for everyone and anyone not to wear a mask. That's just not, I, I think, the case. And he certainly uh, presents that here as he says to him, masks are fine. So I, I want to reiterate that uh, as I play this audio, that the president of the United States is not against masks like you may have heard. Mr. President, uh, before I let you go, the, the, everything seems to be political now. Uh, we, we talk about masks. Uh, you can see this uh, yeah. really nice it's good. Trump I like It's that. really nice Trump it's mask. Nice. Will you consider wearing a mask? And if not, how come? Well, I've already had masks, and I've worn a mask. And if I'm near people, you know, you were tested, right, just now. Tested. And everybody that's around me as president gets tested. That's, like, standard. Uh, and I'm also, I keep distances. I'm, you know, supposed to keep a distance, and I keep distances. But if I needed a mask, if I was in a crowd, a, you know, a crowd, a lot of people and everything else, I'd wear them. I have no problem with a mask at all. And I tell people, but I have a different kind of a life. Being president, you have a little bit of a different life. You're not that often. I don't think it makes sense when you walk up. I see Biden walking up on a stage. You know, I got to stop this for a second. I love this, this last mention here when he talks about Joe Biden and what he looks like when he wears a mask when no one is around. Uh, I, I wear a mask at times. I, I, I think it's smart to do it. I think a lot of us should do it. Uh, I, I'm not against it either, and much like apparently the president is not against it. But... When you're outdoors, say after you get out of the grocery store or whatever, and if no one is around you, if you're walking to your car alone, uh, no one in the general vicinity, certainly no one within six feet of you, it's okay to take the mask off in those situations. It's not protecting you from anything. It's not protecting anyone else from you at that point because you're completely isolated and outside. And I see this all the time, uh, just as the president does 
at press conferences or whatever else that the mask is rocked to an extent that <laughs> to me seems weird. But here, let's see. Let's hear what President Trump felt about that. That often, I don't think it makes sense when you walk up. I see Biden walking up on a stage where there's nobody around and the audience is 25, 30, 40 feet away. Not too much of an audience either, by the way. And he's speaking and he has a mask on and you can't even understand what he's saying or he takes it off up there. When there's nobody around, I don't see any reason to be wearing it. But no, I have no objection to masks whatsoever. Do what you're supposed to do and also do what makes you feel good. Right. Do what makes you feel good. Do what you're supposed to do. Do what those uh, in the health departments that are in your area recommend that you do. And most importantly, uh, and I love the fact that this was asked as a political question because everything is politicized in today's day and age. But if you are, I don't know, someone who's about to give some sort of address, maybe on television, maybe you're running for president and you're uh, the Democratic candidate who doesn't want, really want to be on TV all that often, you don't need to rock a mask all the way up until you you get in front of the mic if no one is around you. You don't need to wear it. You don't need to have it on. It doesn't have to be a political statement of any kind. It's really just a thing to protect us from each other and to help in limiting the spread of COVID-19. And obviously, there's been a lot of news in the last few days about COVID-19 and how much it's uh, it's maybe the outbreak has changed. I saw an interview uh, with Tucker Carlson. It was Dr. Mark Siegel, who often appears on Fox News. There were some comments about that, uh, about the recent outbreaks in some areas that I found interesting. I'm going to play that. we got to take a break. I will play that audio for you when we come back because I, I think it's it's tremendously valuable to have a discussion about it. It's something that you hear a lot. Are the numbers what we think they are? Are there some ways in which they might be enhanced? And Dr. Mark Siegel is certainly a person that would understand it better than me. So a quick break and a lot more. Craig Collins filling in on the Chad Benson Show. Set Chad straight. Text the show, 323-538-2423. That's 323-538-CHAD. Someone has to do it. Might as well be you. The Chad Benson Show. Greg Collins filling in on the Chad Benson Show. Hope you're having a good day today. Uh, thrilled to be here. Chad back next week. Uh, happy almost 4th of July, by the way, to everyone out there in the world uh, that will celebrate that holiday. And I'm going to continue to say that I hope we keep this one the same. And no one asks us to change it for any reason. Uh, I, I want to cover what happened on Tucker Carlson's show last night. I thought it was tremendously interesting. Dr. Mark Siegel uh, was speaking about coronavirus, the surge in numbers that you've heard on the news all over the place, that it's getting worse and worse and worse in a lot of areas. And there's aspects aspects of that that, of course, will, will 100% be true. Uh, it, it seems that in some cases, I'm worried. I don't know about you, but I, I get a little worried. And then I hear this conversation and I wonder maybe, hmm, Maybe some things are, are changing. Maybe some numbers are are a little bit less than accurate. Uh, here's what he said. Tucker, it's being widely reported that there's over 40,000 new cases of COVID-19 yesterday. It's been widely reported that the South and the West have been hard hit. It's been widely reported that Texas, Arizona, California, and Florida are reversing aspects of their reopening. It's been widely reported that Dr. Tony Fauci says we could see as much as 100,000 new cases a day. I'm not sure where that number comes from, but that's what he says. That's all been widely reported. Here's what hasn't been reported. As the case counts are going up, the death rate remains under 700 per 24 hours per day of new cases. Why? Why is that? Because most of the people that are getting COVID-19 now are young people. And the CDC just re released a statistic that again was not reported, that of the last 15,000 deaths from COVID-19, only 3.9% were under the ages of 44 years old. The same group that's now spreading it in Miami or spreading it in Austin, Texas, or spreading it in Phoenix. You know, there's a lot to un uh, digest or unpack just from that simple statement so far that the people who are getting sick are different than the people who got sick before. We've seen a lot of numbers, even from The New York Times, about how devastating coronavirus can be if its outbreak uh, happens within a, a retirement facility, re in a nursing home, in something where there's a lot of a certain community there, a lot of people that are more at risk than people that are young and, I guess, getting, getting it while hitting the beach or something to that effect. But uh, 
Uh, Dr. Siegel went on. That group has mild cases. It's been widely reported, as you just said, that the hospitalization rate is going up, but it's not reported that it's not mostly COVID-19. It's actually the cases that were there because of the reopening, because they're now getting the elective surgeries they need, cancer operations, heart disease operations, hernia operations. That They're filling the hospitals. Only the COVID-19 is actually getting in the way of that because these mild cases require isolation. You know, what's really surreal about that second point, too, that he's made is what he's saying is that people are being diagnosed with COVID-19 after going to the hospital for some other uh, reason, for going to the hospital to get an elective surgery or going to the hospital to be treated for something else. And if you get COVID-19 while at the hospital, well, now you're a COVID patient. And that may not be something that they're currently fighting. It may not be something that they're even struggling with. But a hospitalization may, in fact, happen because of a different reason, and then you are lumped into the same group as people that need your help, that need hospitals to get over COVID-19. That is a surreal concept. I don't know. I I haven't seen all the numbers, and I can't digest them the way that any doctor can. So I I don't know how accurate that statement will wind up being in certain places, but it's it's aligned with some other things that you've heard before about COVID-19, which is that hospitals are sort of pushed to, to diagnose people with it as opposed to not. If someone comes in for any reason and they also happen to test positive for COVID-19, even if they're asymptomatic, there is a benefit in a lot of ways, I guess, to to put them in the same bucket, which is just uh, confusing. We will do so much in the public space reacting to all the numbers, all the things that we're getting from different states, from different organizations. And yet these numbers are are flawed, apparently, Uh, to say it as as mildly as possible. These numbers may not be the only way in which we understand how serious current outbreaks are. Is that Does that mean I'm telling you guys that I don't believe what's going on in a Texas, that I don't believe what's going on in any of the places that are seeing outbreaks? No, I, I have no idea sometimes what is accurate and inaccurate. I will always, uh, myself personally, shy more toward caution than not. But at the same time, I understand just how devastating it is to have our economy shut back down in places where they, they simply can't, in places where we are struggling so much already financially. All right, Craig Collins filling in on the Chad Benson Show. Thrilled to have you with me. The Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins. I'm filling in with you. Uh, Thrilled to be here, having a great time uh, hanging out with you uh, and hopefully uh, doing it again, I think, a couple more times. Chad is back next week. Uh, Giselle Maxwell has been arrested. She is the British socialite and heiress uh, who was a confidant of disgraced financer and deceased human uh, Jeffrey Epstein. He was she was accused of involvement in his alleged sex crimes. She was arrested by the FBI. Two senior law enforcement sources have told several different organizations uh, she was arrested in New Hampshire, actually, on Epstein related charges and is expected to appear in federal court uh, today. So that'll be an interesting thing to to go through to, to see. Uh, I don't know uh, the Epstein stuff. Every time this comes up, every time I see it, all the conspiracies that you hear about all the time, they run through my brain. And something I always tell people about conspiracies is I, I never deny the plausibility of anything. If you tell me that something could have happened, I'll, I'll never tell you that there's no way that could happen because anything I think is plausible. At the same time, I, I could never be involved in a c- conspiracy myself because I'm, I'm a terrible liar. I'm a horrible, horrible secret keeper. I'm just a person who can't navigate any of that stuff. So I guess when my brain sees all the ways in which these horrible things happen or these these terrible people do awful things, and then maybe you think, hey, uh, did a guy commit suicide or was he killed? Uh, my brain just goes, I can't I can't play in this in this ballpark. So I have no idea. I'm, I'm just going to back up and get out of here because uh, I don't know what else to do. But I wanted to mention that because I saw it come across my Twitter feed. And uh, it is an interesting, interesting uh, breaking story, at least for sure. Right now, we'll see uh, where that goes. I also want to touch on AOC for just a second, because to me, AOC, look, let me say it this way. I, I, I get in trouble 
for a lot of with a lot of my friends when I say it this way, I don't expect every time that AOC opens her mouth for for the things that come out to be dumb. I, I don't. And I know that a lot of people who who hear her talk and, and hear the position she takes on things, they wonder if she's just doing it to be as far to one side as humanly possible to be uh, on on her own island, I guess, all the way in the corner to the left. Uh, but I don't. A- every time she speaks, I assume that maybe sometimes something somewhat rational could come out of her mouth. So I try to judge each statement individually uh, based on its own merit. But this one, oh, this one. Uh, when she was talking the other day, I think, about the the New York City proposal to reduce the budget, to cut the NYPD budget by a billion dollars, what AOC said is that wasn't enough. A billion dollars to her is, is nowhere near the right response, I guess. To, to And I think that that by itself, just alone, reacting to the idea that you cut the budget of the biggest city in our country by that amount uh, would be staggering. Uh, that is a, a huge amount to chunk out of a budget and just do it kind of reactively. Because uh, that's the other thing I think. I've, I've reacted so many times to stories going on, certainly what happened in Seattle, uh, the ups and downs that were the chop, mostly downs, and the, the scary things that were happening at night. And then eventually, finally, uh, the desire to go in there and shut that down after weeks and, and countless um, shootings and deaths in the area, after weeks of just allowing it to happen, you, you turn it around and you shut it down. That is an example of reacting to something or allowing something to happen without any sort of forethought or planning. And the same holds true to me in response to these chance to defund the police if you just strip budgets, if you just start taking massive amounts of dollars away from organizations like the NYPD without any real plan of how to how to compensate or how to react to uh, reducing a budget by that much. I, I think that's a really bad decision. I think that you got to take a lot more time and map out any version of change that you think makes sense. AOC doesn't agree. She said, and this is a quote, defunding police means defunding police. It does not mean budget tricks or funny math billion dollars. That's funny math. That's a budget trick. It does not mean moving school police officers from the NYPD budget to the Department of Education's budget to the exact same police remain in schools. AOC speaking. It does not mean counting overtime cuts as cuts, even as NYPD ignores every attempt by city council to curb overtime spending and overspends on overtime. Anyway, if these reports are accurate, then these proposed cuts to the NYPD budget are a disingenuous illusion. This is not a victory. The fight to defund police continues. A billion dollars. I don't even know how to say that without being tempted every single time to reference the Dr. Evil voice, which I'm aware to a lot of people is a very dated reference. But that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money to, to just all of a sudden one day wake up and be like, you know what? Uh, the police don't get a billion dollars anymore. AOC thinks that that's, that's a drop in the bucket. I, I can't. It's surreal to me. And the fact that she's quoted as saying defund the police means defunding the police what are you saying? Are you saying that they get nothing, that there's no more finances that way? And actually, I want to reference one thing. I've seen this covered uh, periodically. Uh, in New Jersey, there was an area that was very, very dangerous. And then eventually the police department uh, could no longer unionize. There was a fight financially for um, compensation and a union went away and police wound up getting paid a lot less. And this area in New Jersey is being touted as an example of, of doing this well of defunding the police being capable of working because the area got much less violent. The difference between that scenario and what a lot of us are talking about, or I guess some are talking about in these areas, is the police were just paid a whole bunch less. It's not like the police force disappeared overnight. They wound up being incapable of, of negotiating their wages like a union can, and they all just lost a lot of their salaries. They hired people who were less experienced. Over time, uh, that place has, has gotten better, has gotten safer, and now those areas, the police are attempting to unionize again to get paid better salaries. So when anyone touts certain areas by saying that, look, this works, here's an example of how it works, they're completely misunderstanding the point. And if you just defund police and have them not exist, you have what you saw in Seattle for days. And actually, you know what, as I'm mentioning that, as I'm talking about that, I might as well go to this audio I have. Uh, Sean Hannity interviewed uh, one of the fathers of a of a child who was killed in the chop. And it, it's going around. It's it's becoming fairly viral, uh, this interview, because uh, Horace Lorenzo Anderson, who is the father of Horace Lorenzo Anderson Jr., uh, said that nobody has reached out to him. The mayor, nobody in Seattle has communicated with this guy after he lost his kid in an area that was at one point kind of approved by a lot of the politicians there, an area that certainly wasn't uh, immediately prevented. 
he hasn't been reached out to. I, I assume maybe that's changed since he gave this interview the other day. I hope it's changed. But no one had communicated with him, which is just surreal to me. Here is part of that conversation. There was nobody there, no media there. There was nothing. He was nobody. He was just like, I was, we was just there. And we just sat there and I said, man, why are we sitting there? There's nobody else here. It's like they didn't care. It didn't matter. And I haven't heard from the mayor. I haven't heard from the police department. I haven't from no, no city and nobody. Nobody. Only thing I heard from is what you guys is hearing from me now. That's it. How shocking is that? Um, in, in your opinion, I, I just want to know how shocking is that, that an area in Seattle is allowed to exist for several weeks called the chop, uh, proudly in autonomous zone, uh, in an area where a lot of the people who live in that area are sort of voice voicing opinions that they didn't really want to be a part of this. They didn't want to be political. They just wanted to live their lives at night. It gets con- incredibly dangerous and people are being shot and killed. Uh, there's another guy I think who survived a shooting in the chop that's that's attempting to sue the police, even though the video shows police trying to respond to his exact uh, uh, experience, his the shooting where he's injured, they are prevented by the people that are in control of the area at the time, and yet he's accusing the police of not responding fast enough, which is surreal uh, to me too. There's so many things about this that are just crazy, but the fact that no one reaches out to this guy after his son gets killed in this area, no one uh, asking how he's doing or, or apologizing for for the experience that his family has to go through now and should not have had to go through. How can that happen? How could you be in a a situation like this where something's being covered so, so consistently and where politicians eventually have to switch gears and go from supporting something to saying, okay, no, this is dangerous and not at all what we had hoped it would be, I guess, not at all the thing we want to tout it to be so that it seems like an example of, of how things can go well, because things did not go well. Uh, in an area when you took the law enforcement people out of it. And again, you just kind of react. You do it overnight. You allow something to take place that should never have taken place. People uh, lose their lives. Uh, a father loses his son. And then no one communicates with him. No, they just move on. They're like, OK, that's the that's the end of this story. Let's hope that no one talks about it anymore. It's surreal. It's surreal to me. And that's certainly the reason why I think that interview is going viral. All right, let's switch gears for a quick second. Let's do a little palate cleanser and try to do something a, a tad Uh, more uplifting, a a tad uh, sillier, in my opinion. I saw this story, and I I wonder if it's true for you. I'd love to hear it on our social media pages, actually. If you go to the Chad Benson Show on social media, he's got a bunch of different platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and tell us, did your pet gain weight during quarantine? A lot of people say that there was a quarantine 15 for humans, but apparently 33% of uh, pet owners noticed that their their pets beefed up just a tad. Uh, uh, And the reason why, I think, is very simple. You're at home all the time. You're at home all the time. We love to give treats to our dogs and cats. It's just a thing we like to do. Uh, Certainly, my wife cannot stop herself in any scenario, even when her family members are begging her not to give a treat to a family pet. I think her cousin one time was like, Betty, you got to stop. You got to pull it back just a bit. She can't do it. She looks at a dog, a a cat. She looks at any kind of pet that gives her a face. She's like, all right, here, here's treats. Uh, You enjoy these. 33% of homeowners are saying that, of pet owners are saying they need to put their pets in a diet because they added some quarantine 15 too. So I'd love to know, did that happen to you guys? Did you see that happen in your own family or to other pets that, that are of friends or relatives that you know? Cause uh, I, I don't think that it happened for anyone I know, but I I'm not surprised at all to see this story and it entertained me quite a bit. Uh, you can also go to the Craig Collins show on Facebook and tell me there, uh, but check out our social media pages for Chad. Uh, this is Craig Collins filling in on the Chad Benson show. A lot more to talk about. Uh, we will cover, cover a argument that the press secretary had with John Carl in just a bit. Being antisocial sucks. Hang with Chad's friends on Facebook, The Chad Benson Show. And if you just need some alone time, head on over to Twitter at Chad Benson Show. Either way, we can't wait to meet the real you. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins, filling in for today. Uh, let's jump to some job numbers. The President of the United States talking about job numbers today and how spectacular this news is. Uh, I love that he's very hyperbolic as a person in general. That's one of his favorite things. Adjectives are his jam. Uh, but let's hear from the President. Who just announced the spectacular news for American workers and American families and for our country 
as a whole. There's not been anything like this, a record setting. It was just put out that the United States economy added almost 5 million jobs in the month of June, shattering all expectations. I was watching this morning and the expectations were much lower than that. The stock market is doing extremely well, which means to me jobs. That's what it means, jobs. This is the largest monthly jobs gain in the history of our country. The unemployment rate fell by more than two percentage points, down to just about 11 percent. We're down to the 11 percent number. We started at a number very much higher than that. As you know, we broke the record last month, and we broke it again this month in an even bigger way. This news comes on top of May's extraordinary jobs report, which was revised upwards, by the way, to 2.7 million jobs. It was 2.5. That was last month, and that was a record setter. But it actually got a little bit better. We revised it. It was revised upward to 2.7 million jobs for a combined total of 7.5 million jobs created in the last two months. And that's a record by many millions of jobs. So. Look, I, I think that this is a number the president is certainly right to tout uh, because obviously one of the biggest focuses throughout the entirety of his presidency has been how well the economy was doing. And then because of COVID-19 and the the obvious need, I guess, in some areas to certainly protect us from spreading the virus and thus impacting our economy to a a devastating degree, things went a different road. Uh, now, obviously, as things start to rebound, you'll hear this narrative a lot as a talking point of the president to help with his reelection campaign, it makes sense. Uh, there is one caveat to all of this, though. It's it's very odd the way in which a lot of these numbers both ways, both the unemployment and then the job creation numbers are going to go probably for the next few months. Um, and this is just true. A, a lot of the ways in which I guess people were laid off are, are different than they used to be in the past. People were furloughed. People have get, been rehired for jobs that they lost as the economy reopened. So this goes up and down a lot. Uh, and these numbers will probably be all over the place, but they are, they're record setting numbers. And it is spectacular news. Every so often when the president throws in an adjective, I wonder if the adjective made sense, but here it does. Uh, that is, that is 5 million almost jobs created in the last month. And again, it might be people regaining employment that they previously had, but actually probably heightens the, the need for us to have the economy open and working and finding ways to address public health issues as they, as they outbreak in certain areas while still trying to understand that there's a financial component to everything we do. Uh, And actually, even Dr. Fauci, I saw recently in an interview referencing how he's an expert in some things and not other things. And it's a, it's a talking point. I've, I've had a lot. I don't think he actually talks about it as far as financials go. He mentions it in different ways, but it's true. Uh, Any person, whoever it is, however accurate their numbers are, Fauci's not always the best, uh, but whatever they're going to say, if they're a medical professional can only give you the medical part of the advice the financial part of the advice is is something you need to gain from others. So the president talking about job creation makes sense. It's something that I think you'll keep hearing. And it's something that I think will keep going upward and downward. Also, actually, Mitch McConnell saying that he's he's ready and Republicans are ready to discuss what's next as far as stimulus goes should be exciting for everybody. I know that a lot of people say that they were worried uh, that the world changes in a, in a at the end of this month. Obviously, the way in which the unemployment paychecks are are currently going is probably not something sustainable or something that makes sense moving forward. Uh, Anything the Democrats have recommended in the past and or passed in the House is is not a viable option at all. Uh, But Mitch McConnell, he is very ready to sit down and have a lot of those discussions as soon as they get back from their break because he wants this done now. And it's got to be done now. And hopefully everyone, this is the silliest sentence I might say today, hopefully all the politicians can come together quickly on that because uh, they need to. They need to do a lot to make sure that everything makes sense. Uh, in a positive way. There's a lot going on today. A lot of things I'm thrilled to talk about. Uh, MLB baseball is back. At least the the preseason is getting underway. So that's very exciting to me. Players will be tested often. Uh, some players have chosen not to participate in the season, and I don't think anyone should be mad at them for that. It's it's each player's decision. We're going to touch on that a little bit. Uh, we have some other stories in the news that, that I find interesting. Uh, some decisions being made by the Houston Association of Realtors. Yes, that is something I find interesting because of the words they think they can't say anymore. And I, I, I don't know. Uh, also, Beavis and Butthead is coming back. And it, the reboot to me of that show in 2020 is one of the more shocking stories I've heard. Uh, honestly, it really is. Out of all the things that I've heard this year, and a lot of them have been shocking, a lot of them have been sad. But to bring back a show that was proudly stupid 
uh, and I enjoyed, I'm not, I'm not saying I don't like it, uh, is, is to me probably one of the decisions I didn't expect. In 2020, if you had told me, or I guess before this year started, from an entertainment perspective, that Ellen DeGeneres would be at, at risk of losing her job because she's mean, and Beavis and Butthead is a show that might be back on television, I wouldn't have believed you. But the, the world changes in a lot of different ways all the time. Uh, certainly, certainly the entertainment world does. So there's a, there's a lot going on. Uh, this is the Craig Collins. Well, this is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins. I'm filling in on this. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. The president going to continue to probably highlight some some job numbers. Uh, and there's maybe some other audio I'll play from that. I also have, I, I mentioned this, and I, I don't think we got to it yet. The the Kaylee McEnany, John Carl uh, debate that happened yesterday. And that debate to me is so interesting because it's so simplistic, the way that the question is asked about Black Lives Matter and the things the president is tweeting. And, and it obvious, it's obvious to me that the, the intention is to go a certain way, that the desire from the, the question being asked by a John Carl or to, to push Kaylee to say some things that she just doesn't think are true. And she handles it well. I'll have that. A lot of stuff. Craig Collins filling in on The Chad Benson Show. This is the Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. I am Craig Collins filling in for today. Chad will be back next week enjoying a early July 4th, uh, a very deserved early July 4th uh, weekend for him uh, because it's a lot of hard work every single day showing up and reporting all the crazy things that exist in the world. Uh, Sometimes I wish I could just talk about things like Batman, but I know that that's not that's not important. We got to cover the things that matter. Uh, I, I saw this argument on Wednesday and it just, it it was interesting in a lot of ways. Uh, John Carl of ABC talking to Kaylee McEnany at a press conference, at a, at a press briefing from the press secretary. And the way in which some of these, the question itself, I guess, is worded and then the follow-up to it. All of it, by the way, it's a debate on something that the president put on his social media pages, uh, condemning the violence, the, the hatred that is the Black Lives Matter organization. Not, not any cause or, or any... Um, protesting around the idea that lives matter, certainly lives of, of black people matter. The actual organization itself, which Kaylee points out in a lot of ways, has said some things that are that are interesting, uh, to say the very least. But here, hear this exchange, and this, I think, is the problem. And this is what a lot of people who are supporters of the president will say is the problem as far as the way in which the press is just out for any and all kind of gotchas. They're, they're desperate to have this... This headline that says President Trump racist because President Trump this because and every single day I feel like a lot of the people who wake up covering the president are just they they need the headline that is the most outlandish and or I guess some of them, including John, write books about these kind of things and, and hope that that's what sells. But let's let's hear part of this exchange. I might interrupt it as it happens just to just to get a feel for what it's like to to take a podium to be either the president or anyone that works for him and deal with the press questions that you're lobbed uh, on a daily basis. Why is the president calling Black Lives Matter a symbol of hate? Well, what the president um, was noting is that uh, that symbol, um, when you look at some of the things that have been chanted by Black Lives Matter, like pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon, um, that's not an acceptable phrase to paint on our streets. Look, he agrees um, that All Black Lives Matter, including that of Officer David Dorn, Patrick Underwood, two officers whose lives were tragically taken amid these riots. All Black Lives do matter. He agrees with that sentiment. But what he doesn't agree with is an organization that chants pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon about our police officers, our valiant heroes who are out on the street protecting us each and every day. That could be the end of the exchange. This could be the end of the exchange. Uh, He asked the question, why does the president tweet something? Uh, Kaylee answers the question, I think, in an acceptable way. Uh, referencing some of the problems that exist within the organization 
that calls themselves the Black Lives Matter organization, not the the other thing that gets talked about a lot in places like Twitter, uh, Black Lives Matter, the simple sentiment. They are two different things. And I think that and here's another thing that actually got pointed out uh, quite a few times in social media after the tweets is that if you capitalize all three letters, it's sort of the social media standard for referencing the organization and not the the idea. It's that's the difference. And the uh, just for your information in the tweet in question that's being debated right now, uh, he did capitalize BLM, uh, Black Lives Matter, because he was referencing an organization and not a not a thought. But let's continue. Americans of all races have protested in all 50 states uh, around that phrase, Black Lives Matter. And the president is here calling it a symbol of hate. He's talking about the organization. Um, I would note to you that the greater New York BLM president has said, if this country doesn't give us what we want, that we will burn down the system. And I could be speaking literally. I'd call that a pretty hateful statement. But, but Kelly, yes, he's not talking about the organization in his tweet. He says yes, the words. Ben. He says the words. Which, Black Lives what's Matter. What's the name of the organization again? Black Lives Matter. There you go. You yes, just answered the, the, my question. Look at this. Look at how hard it is to even get someone to admit that that the name of the organization is what it is and that the president may have been. Uh, and a lot of people think, obviously, and even the person who then talks to him and asks him what he meant, uh, think that he was referencing an organization that does have some messaging that is, uh, I don't know, uh, for lack of any other word, scary. Uh, they have some messaging that that sounds the burn everything down if, if they don't get what they want message is not exactly the same thing that a Martin Luther King said to people uh, when he was trying to create different changes within our society. And so as you as you hear this exchange, as you hear the the back and forth, and it seems like John Carl is dead set uh, on getting a different answer and a different reaction, no matter what is said, no matter what facts are used. Facts don't matter. <laughs> I, they should, but it doesn't seem like they do. I don't understand so much of this, so much of how this all goes. Uh, oh, oh, well, all right, I got to move on. Otherwise, I'm going to get more upset. Uh, This is in the news today and something that's not shocking, I think, to a lot of people. Firearm sales have skyrocketed nationwide in response to the defund the police riots. 70 percent up last month, year over year uh, in the amount of firearm sales. Background checks for gun sales spiked again in June, setting a new record for the highest number of checks in one month as nationwide protests, riots and the coronavirus pandemic all continue to increase safety concerns for so, so many Americans, the National Instant Crime uh, Criminal Background Check System conducted 3.9 million checks in June, an increase of 70 percent since June of 2019. Uh, last month's numbers broke the previous record of 2.7 million checks, which happened in March. 3.9 million. Already this year, the FBI has recorded 19 million checks in the system, more than uh, we recorded during first 14 years of the system's existence, uh, which has been operating since 1998. Only six months in 2020, uh, the surge in checks is already nearing last year's record of 28 million background checks. I'm absolutely a supporter of everybody's right to have firearms. I am scared, though, of everybody's feeling that they need to have firearms in the house because defund the police is a thing that's gaining traction in a lot of places. If you feel, and it's probably rightly so, that your community will no longer have law enforcement officials to make sure to protect uh, the community as a whole, You'd have to take it up on your own. You'd have you'd have to react a certain way. And this should be one of the many things going on that tells us that there's there's a better way to handle any and all changes that need to happen as far as as far as the things that that are agreed upon, Uh, the things that have have come in the wake of of the death of George Floyd and the better understanding maybe that a lot of people have to just how difficult it might be uh, for minority populations, certainly for black men to interact with with some, not all, law enforcement officials. And even when you say that sentence, by the way, when you say not all, you're attacked uh, by some people. And that makes absolutely no sense to me. Uh, one, because there's people who are, are black and police officers. And I don't know what they're saying about uh, police officers who are black, but certainly uh, there's several, several, a large majority of those who serve our community, who care to do it correctly, and who are not worried about who it is that they're protecting and, and not you know, adding any sort of uh, additional biases to that conversation. They are protecting the community as a whole, all people within it. But 70% jump last month, year over year, in the amount of people that are looking to to gain a firearm because they feel a need to protect themselves, that does not create an atmosphere that is anywhere close to what some people might idealistically say is, everybody's just peaceful, you know? Uh, police officers go away and everybody's just nice to each other. That's not the society that many of us expect it to be. And a lot of people are fearful 
that that's a thing that could happen. I also saw this. A councilwoman asked the LAPD chief to order officers to take a knee during a Black Lives Matter protest. I'm sure you remember the virality of some of these things uh, when you would see police officers join hand in hand with protesters and ask for change to exist. Uh, These things were celebrated by everybody, I think, but certainly by people supporting certain causes on social media and where have you. And yet the way in which this is done, you would think is almost always voluntary to hear that that people might have been ordered to do things. And it appears that the the L.A. police chief, uh, Michael Moore, did not follow this order. But it's just surreal to me that it could have existed at all, that anyone, any politician would try to tell um, someone to, to issue a thing like how could this have not if this had broken at the time, say police were ordered to do something and say a police officer leaked that information. How much different of a story is this right now than just reporting on you on some text messages that were located between the L.A. City Council President Nuri Martinez and representatives for the police department chief Michael Moore? In those text messages, it says, FYI, uh, this is, I think, one of the representatives to uh, the police chief. Uh, Nuri Martinez wants the department to order officers at City Hall to take a knee. She was advised it was voluntary and will not be given an order. She may try to reach out to you directly. Uh, you you might relay to TJ and Jarrett. Uh, she can reach out to me. I'm not going to order people to take a knee. Encourage, model the way, not tell anybody what to do. That is, it's... That's the most disingenuous version of something, by the way, if it had happened. Say it did happen and say police officers didn't feel uh, appropriate in doing it, which they have every right to not feel that way. And yet they're they're forced to do it and do it. Then that image is forever tainted to it. It's desiring to make fake news in a way that I can't even comprehend. And uh, I, there's so many things about this that I don't understand. There's also a soccer player who's speaking out today. Uh, one of the women's soccer players where her whole team is pretty much taken a knee and she doesn't want to. And she's trying to defend her right to not do that because of the things she believes the national anthem, the flag represent. And people are attacking her now. Uh, people are attacking anyone that that disagrees with, I guess, what is the current uh, feeling within the, the world itself. And I, I don't know how that makes sense to everyone who wants you to be so understanding, wants you to listen so bad. Uh, the people who, who will chant every single day, for you to listen to them sometimes seem to be the ones that are that are really struggling to listen to anyone else uh, giving an opinion on a lot of what's going on in the world. Uh, this is Craig Collins filling in on the Chad Benson show. Uh, excited to stick with you here. I want to talk about Beavis and Butthead. I do. There's a reboot. It's coming back. Dumb, dumb show. Proud to be stupid. And it's going to exist in our world in 2020. And I am I'm surprised by that. Uh, that and more after this. The Chad Benson Show, where independent a la carte thinkers have a seat at the table and a voice in the dialogue. I'll have what she's having. This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins, filling in. Uh, Thrilled to be here. Let's talk more job numbers real quick. This is something I I played uh, a couple other times. I'll keep playing. Uh, Steve Mnuchin, he talked about the focus that they have. He has actually asked a question by one John Carl, who's a guy that at times asks some interesting questions for sure. Uh, but he talked about the the difference in a lot of the numbers, the unemployment numbers and the the job creation numbers and what's important and what his focus is when he really feels the work will be done. And it's, it's a good thing uh, that he's focused on, I think, every single person getting back to work. Here is Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin. To see uh, new unemployment claims rising, we're at 1.4 million layoffs last week, and that number is actually going up, not going down. Are you concerned about that? Well, let me just say again. I want to just say we're going to be concerned till every single person is back to work. Now, when you look at these numbers, I think uh, it's tough enough to predict economic numbers in normal times. In, in these times, you have to look at all these numbers in the entirety. So uh, what I would say on that is there's a lag on the unemployment claims. I think you also know many of these states we set up front are completely backed up. So no, I, I would focus on the, the, the jobs numbers are the most accurate numbers, the trend of 8 million jobs back. But having said that, I'm concerned until we get everybody back to work. Everybody back to work. I am concerned until we get everybody back to work. I think a lot of America is. And I think that the reason why the stimulus conversation has existed the way it has and that uh, people are not maybe interested in extending some of the 
unemployment pay that uh, might worry a lot of people is because it, it's dis uh, it's a disincentive for a lot to do things like find jobs, get back to work. And maybe it even so uh, for some employers to try to recruit people right now, if you're making a certain amount of money uh, on unemployment, it would be hard for a, a job, an employer to actually offer you something that you think would be as interesting as not uh, doing that gig and getting paid potentially more money. So there's a lot going on here. Uh, certainly the job numbers today have been very positive and something that we uh, will hear more about and I think deserves to be highlighted. And it's certainly one of the successes of this president to to, to point to the economy. I, I mean, look at the economy and the way it's rebounded and how quickly it's done uh, within a, a unprecedented time. That is something to at least uh, uh, acknowledge here as best we can. All right. I want to move on to Beavis and Butthead. I want to talk about this for a while and I'm trying to restrain myself. I, I like the show. I like the show. I think it's funny. I think it's always been kind of funny. It's certainly not something that I thought made sense in the current 2020 climate, not because I won't be entertained by it, but because a whole lot of people will complain about a lot of the things that are on this show. But a huge announcement yesterday that it's coming back and it'll be on Comedy Central. Uh, Mike Judge, who created the program and is going to be writing for it, said it seemed like the time was right to get stupid again. It seemed like the time was right. I don't know if he's referring to uh, some of our politicians. Uh, if AOC will make an appearance on the show, maybe. Who knows? But does that seem like the right time? I, I, I think so. I think this sounds great. This show is is stupidity and proud of it. A lot of the things they do are are definitely less than woke. And yet they're, they're being highlighted all over the place. People are celebrating this. I don't understand that, by the way. If you're somebody on social media who can say that so many people don't understand and everything is is so inappropriate in today's day and age, or even uh, attack the president for some of the ways in which he interacts, and then celebrate the return of Beavis and Butthead, who, who are you? Who are you as a person if you, if you can't handle uh, one version of things and then you love a cartoon show that is is proud of the fact that it's that it's dumb and it's it's entertainingly dumb in my opinion but it, it's certainly a thing that i didn't see coming back all right one last thing uh, one last headline just because it amuses me a lot uh, i saw this story out of duluth minnesota uh, i look uh, for news all over the place and i enjoy to look for news all over the place a naked guy got in the sewer there the authorities were looking for a man a search had to end i think it was yesterday uh wednesday afternoon when uh, uh, Duluth authorities figured out, one, that a guy who abandoned his clothing and went into the sewer was no longer in the sewer, and two, they had no idea what he was doing there in the first place, but you got to give up on that. And I've said this to friends uh, when I talked about this story, when I first saw it. If I was a responder in this situation, if you hear, one, that someone was, for whatever reason, interested in climbing into a city sewer that they shouldn't be in, and then, two, did so naked, I would not respond to that situation. I would call out. I would get blue flu for this for sure. Uh, because this makes no sense to me. If you meet this guy in the sewer while he's wearing no clothing, that interaction's not going to be awesome. No matter what he does, it's not going to be great. Although I will say in defense of him, <laughs> which is a sentence I'm, I'm proud I'm saying, if I were forced into a sewer, I would be worried about the things that would get on both my, my person and my clothing. And I think we've seen several TV shows, sitcoms, Always Sunny in Philadelphia, one that references the, the intelligence in, in maybe not taking the clothing with you. Uh, which I'm, I'm so glad that I'm referencing Always Sunny when talking about an actual news story that exists. I just, I just don't get it, though, man. I, why? Why in, on earth do you climb into a sewer and you also do it naked? And then why on earth would anyone have to respond to this? If they, eh, They're doing their due diligence was part of the, I think, the press release I saw is that, you know, they, they got to respond. They got to get in there. But this is not a guy you want to meet. This is not no scenario. In no scenario do I actually want to meet someone who's inappropriately naked. You know what I mean? Like if you're in an alley and you come across a guy that seems intimidating and also happens to not be wearing any clothing, that's a guy you leave alone. That's a guy you do not interact with and you tell him have a nice day. Certainly if he's in a sewer, you wish him well and see you later. Craig Collins filling in on the Chad Benson Show. Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. 
This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. Uh, A lot of times you'll hear ways in which news is covered, and it just won't make sense to people who remember the, the way media celebrated anything and everything that the previous president used to do and derides, hates, accuses of, of, you know, the worst decision making in the history of our country, everything that our current president does. I think no story is more emblematic of this than the one about Russia, the one about the bounties that could have existed that were offered to uh, militants to kill U.S. troops. This may have resulted in a a death of one U.S. military member. Uh, This story in and of itself, the way in which it's been reported by The New York Times and other places If it's true, and I do say if it's true, because there is debate on that and debate that may actually uh, be far more valid than you and I uh, could think it is if we just read the things from the media sources that exist now. Uh, But if it's true, this horrible, this terrible story, and it's something that certainly our president or anyone would need to to react to. But then here's the caveat. And this is the thing that that always shocks me in the way in which the president at times makes decisions as far as our our. Uh, relationship with other countries as far as any sort of international uh, relations that we have when he chooses not to take action when he chooses not to provoke not to um, um, use military force he's criticized for it in a way that I never expected you've got to remember and I want to go back to when he was running for president the first time in 2016 and how so many people said that he would be absolutely ill-equipped to deal with any sort of conflict because he would be Trigger happy. He would be a guy that you could not trust with a ability to control things like nuclear weapons because he would absolutely bring us you, into a you war. Know, that was the narrative a hundred percent before this man takes office and does the things that he does, makes the decision he makes. And are they are they always going to be right? I no. Uh they're not always going to be right. But in this case, what he's again doing is is using caution. Uh, as far as I'm to understand it, and I know there's a lot of debate as to when the president was even briefed on these stories in the first place. But the the White House is even now debating what information they should make public to help demonstrate the fact that there is skepticism in the reporting here in the idea that Russia was behind bounties that were offered to Taliban link militants. This this is a thing that's happening. And whether or not the president believes the reports are actionable or even true, this is according to several senior administration officials who maybe stepped forward uh, in some ways to, to let us know. Uh, Trump tweeted the other day that just another made up fake news tale that is told only to damage me and the Republican Party. Look, if The New York Times isn't sure that this is accurate, it is utterly irresponsible uh, to put this out there. And if there is ways the administration can do things to release information without putting our our safety in jeopardy, without putting our country's safety in jeopardy, I, I think it might make sense to to do that. But it's it's a shame to me that it'd have to come to that, that you'd actually need to have White House officials release information that's not supposed to be public in order to disprove a media narrative because every single thing that the president does has to be the wrong thing, according to some some people, according to some news organizations. And when he he actually uh, uses restraint, when he actually wants to make sure that information, just think of it this way. This is the best thing I can say. If this is happening in the time of Obama, if Obama hears a report like this and chooses not to act on it, how does the media cover that? Uh, just out of curiosity, how do you think they cover it? They absolutely would be saying that restraint is so incredible, that this president is amazing for his ability to make sure that something is accurate before making any sort of decision to sanction or or other uh, actions against another country, that he is he is forward thinking and everything he does is so, you know, abundantly well, uh, well executed. And, and he's got to make sure that's that's the way it would be covered if this were years ago. The way it's covered now is president totally unaware of something how could he not have known about this how could he possibly mistrust this this is obviously a fact and he's totally screwed up in his response to it that's that's crazy and then when the press secretary has to try to defend that position and gets questions about it too it's uh, to me it's another reason and yet many many reasons why it's so difficult to trust media right now it is so challenging to watch anything they say anything they do and not hear in their voice, much less in the way they cover something, the the amount of desire they have for you to hear the story a certain way and the amount of bias they put into their conversations. It's just, to me, a, a surreal yet another occurrence uh, that, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what the best thing to do. I know that uh, there was media reports a while back that it resurfaced of President Trump having his own radio show. As a guy that does this, I think that'd be really interesting to have the president on a radio show. That might be the only way 
uh, other than Twitter and Facebook, who are now in some ways even censoring the president, for him to get his narrative out on his own, to have no one else change it, criticize it, to just have him tell us what he thinks. I think he'd be a great, I think he'd be an exceptional host. I know that didn't work out, but maybe there's, there's always time. There's always time, Mr. President, if you want to figure that out. Uh, a study by Italian doctors going to the coronavirus uh, says the virus has actually become less lethal over time within hospitals in Italy. You may remember that Italy was tragically hit uh, by a devastating uh, amount of, of, of serious illness and death from COVID-19. Their population is older than most within the world, uh, but patients are divided into two different groups uh, for 20-day different studies. Uh, date of last follow-up was about the 12th of this month. Uh, the minimum follow-up for the last patient hospitalized was 30 days. A total of 14% of patients required the ICU. Of the 950 patients, 30-day mortality rate was 17%. That is a dramatic drop, though. It's a scary number, but a dramatic drop from the the first time uh, that this sort of study went went in place, where it was 24%. Uh, age and time and, administra- and admission were independent predictors of hospital mortality in multiple different models that they searched. Uh, there are a number of possible reasons that may help explain these findings. In the institution, the proportion of patients requiring ICU decreased from 17% to 7 without significant change in patient age. This suggests that there may be a difference in the way in which the virus is, is currently spreading, or maybe even I, I've, saw, I've seen reports that there might be two different strands of COVID-19, and the more dominant strand now is the one that's less likely to be lethal, less likely to be serious, and it's just more infectious, which is interesting. But but as we hear different reports and different information in our country or others, it makes sense to take a step back to look for a second at some of the things going on in the other places of the world who fought this and the information they're seeing now. Obviously, there's also been a lot of progress in some of the treatments, not necessarily a cure or a vaccine, but some of the treatments for COVID-19. So that may be additionally pushing numbers a certain direction. I saw this, the Houston Association of Realtors will no longer use the term master to describe a be- a bedroom in a house because it is connected to, uh, it has roots in slavery and it's connected to to terms that are now completely un- unacceptable. They will call the master bedroom the primary bedroom and they will call it the primary bathroom. Not that I actually have a problem per se with what a realtor calls a bedroom in a house, but I, I wonder when I see stories like this, if this is even the kind of changes that people are protesting and asking for. It seems like the sensitivity uh, the sensitivity feelings for so many of us are just off the charts right now. And what is and isn't appropriate, I, I don't know. It, do we want brands to be changing their names and their imagery? Is that what we're, we're looking for? If you're a person who's, who's protesting and asking for a system uh, to change, do you want a, a term like a, a bathroom to no longer be referred to as master and instead be primary, instead be, I don't know, parents and kids? Maybe you just call it that way. You're like, this is the parents one. This is the kids one. And I know that that doesn't work for every family, but I guess that's to me what it's always been. Uh, it's just so surreal to see some of the things going on. And again, I'm not even commenting on this specific story because I really feel that it's it's a, it's something that shouldn't have happened. I, it doesn't matter to me at times the, the lengths we go to this. I mean, the NBA is another great example to me. The NBA is contemplating allowing players to have messages on the back of their jerseys instead of their last names. It's something that players wanted and something the NBA seems to be willing to allow them to do, to put social justice messages on the back of their jersey instead of their name. Now, the NBA is a business, and what they do is they sell a product. That product is a a very well-played game of basketball, and it's very well-played in a lot of places throughout the, throughout the country, of course. Uh, and the reason that I like sports personally, and I'm not going to tell you why you like it, is because it's an escape. When I watch a sport, basketball, baseball, whatever it is that I'm turning on television— it is my desire to watch something that I played as a kid and I'm not good enough to still be playing and enjoy to see. And it's not usually a time where I want to be challenged. And I'm never going to tell a, a celebrity what to do with their platform. If you're a professional athlete, if you're a celebrity and you want to, to delve into political things, you want to go uh, certain roads with that platform, that's up to you. That's fine. Uh, you are also a business, though. Your brand is you. And if it winds up affecting your brand, the messages you you throw out in the world, well, that's that's also on you. That's part of how this all works. And so the NBA, to me, is in some ways making a surprising decision because if it affects the brand, if it makes them less money over time, I wonder if they try to reverse that. And they're also not really sure what messages are going to wind up on the backs of all the players who play this game. Uh, maybe some of them everyone can agree on are make sense, and maybe some of them don't. 
Is there going to be a way to censor messages that they feel are inappropriate for whatever reason? Or what about this? What about if, God forbid, somebody were to to say something in support of, of a group that's maybe not uh, publicly right now getting as no, enough support? People like the the police. If there's someone that has a social media uh, or a, a message of social justice that involves somehow supporting those in, in blue, is that going to be allowed on an NBA player's back? I don't know. I have, It should be. If everything else is, then it, it's something that certainly should be allowed. But will it happen? Will it cause controversy? I have I have no idea. I just can't understand how the way in which the decision making that, that's going on right now uh, feels to be maybe to some appropriate measures in, in addressing the issues that exist within our world. And to others, people like me are more selling gimmicks. I mean, the, the Houston Association of Realtors, to go back to them for just a second, might wind up being more popular, might wind up having more phone calls go their way if they're willing to, to embrace the social changes that people are asking for even if no one really thought about that one, even if no one had, had asked for this to change, if they're on the forefront of it, if they're, you know, uh, monetizing in some ways the the desires of the public, that's that's a, a move that they've made that might be more financial than any of us are really realizing. And yeah, it's just something to me that I'm surprised that these are the kind of changes that maybe people would be calling for. But hey, I don't know. Uh, you let me know if you think that that's a good idea. Call, uh, talk to us on our on our Facebook pages, our social media pages for The Chad Benson Show. And or my pages. All right. I got to take another break. A lot more coming up. Craig Collins filling in on the Chad Benson show. I want to talk a little bit more sports. I want to talk baseball after this. Warning. No snowflake zone. Uninformed opinions are in danger of melting. The Chad Benson show. 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 This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in today. Happy to be with you. Uh, Let's talk about baseball. The baseball season is going to get started. Uh, Spring training games are underway, although I don't know if you still even want to call it spring training. Summer training is underway. Uh, Summer training is going to take place at people's actual ballparks. Uh, There was some debate as to whether or not they should actually go to other facilities. And then because of certain situations going on in some of the areas that are most common for the places that players go, Florida, Arizona, uh, it makes more sense to stay within your own area. That will also be how the season itself happens. Uh, there will really only be play against those you can regionally access, uh, both in your own division and on the opposite side within the NLAL. There will be inter-squad games between those that are close to you. It actually means that the Nationals play the Yankees to open the season, which is pretty interesting uh, to me as a Yankee fan and certainly to a lot of baseball fans because that's a, that's a cool matchup to see going in. Uh, the season obviously much shorter than the average season, and a lot of the numbers I think that we gain this year as far as the regular season are concerned are going to be forgotten. Uh, if someone hits something like 400, no one's going to see that as as a recognizable record book type of thing. It's just going to be a, a thing that you say about a super short season like the one we're about to experience. Uh, there will be a lot of different changes, though, to keep the players safe. And even as players do start to duck out of the season without pay, uh, mind you, which is interesting in and of itself, uh, there's a handful so far have decided they're not going to participate this year, a lot of them uh, citing family members as a reason why. Uh, it's just going to be a, a different experience. They're going to be tested on a every other day basis. All players will be tested for COVID-19 every other day. If their temperature exceeds 100.4, they will be tested and sent home. Even if they don't wind up being sick, they will be precautionarily removed from the, the team, the atmosphere. There are a lot of reports we've also seen in sports of players, uh, in all sports actually, testing positive. The thing about it too, and I want to reference this, is we shouldn't know the names of these players unless they publicize it themselves. It's not the kind of thing that you're allowed to report on. There's certain laws and restrictions that tell you not to publicize people's health information. So the fact that we know about some of the names and the players that are testing positive is is actually a bad thing. We shouldn't know that unless they want us to. Although, obviously, if uh, once the season is going, there's people that randomly get removed from teams, we'll probably be able to figure out, sadly, what's going on there. Um, well, they get tested every other day and get removed from the the, the team, the rest of the interactions will be fairly similar as far as this year and other years go. A lot of rules have changed, though. All 30 teams will be expected to uh, play within their own stadium and, and travel within their own specific area and play nobody else. Uh, this does include a Yankees game that was supposed to take place at uh, the Field of Dreams that I'm sad is not going to take place there because that would have been a cool sight. Uh, the teams for that have been changed. They were curious. People were asking how fans would be treated Fans that might organize outside ballparks might even try to experience games maybe from parking lots. 
They will be discouraged from doing that, but not really prevented, according to uh, this information, although cities and the teams will be left to their own uh, decision-making as far as that go. Umpires will be ready for the season and kind of kept on their own. They'll be working some of the bullpen sessions and, and interacting with players, but uh, separation as much as possible will be a part of this season. There's going to be a DH in the National League, which is tremendously interesting to me, and this is something that only takes place uh, this year. It was part of the debate as to whether or not baseball should come back as to uh, if it should take place next year as well. Extra innings may be the most interesting change, though, and one that obviously is going to shorten games, and that's the desire here. We don't want to see anyone play a a 25-inning game in the current uh, world in which we live. So in extra innings, each team will begin with a runner on second base. The runner, uh, the player... The runner will be the player in the batting order immediately preceding that half innings uh, leadoff hitter, meaning a guy who just got out. He'll wind up popping up on second base. As previously planned, all relief pitchers must face a minimum of three batters, uh, which is probably actually a good thing as far as getting people in and out and and you know interacting less, keep a guy out on the, the mound for a bit longer. Opening day rosters will feature 30 active players from a team of 60, uh, which is very interesting to me. And then they'll start to trim that down as the season progresses allowing for 28 players by the 15th, 26 players by the 29th, and just continuing to go on here. I'm tremendously interested in how how many, how many big the ratings will be for this season, how many people uh, will follow the regular season in depth and be interested in baseball this year because it's such an atypical year for this sport uh, as far as the amount of games being played and the amount of, of value that that has as far as who does and doesn't make the playoffs. The playoffs will be expanded, which makes sense to me, and that's, that's a good thing uh, to choose to do because – yeah, even the Nationals would not have made the playoffs had it been a 60-game season because they started really slow, and you might see that a lot. But even even so, I think there's going to be a lot of challenges, and I wonder, and, and maybe this is a thing to tell us on our social media pages, will the World Series winner this year be someone that, that you think uh, you'll respect? Is this a season that you'll actually look at and say, okay, whoever wins this year is a real champion, or do they forever have an asterisk in front of their name? And if they do have an asterisk, then I, I wonder if maybe that's part of the reason why some players wind up sitting out. Some players feel that a season in which a lot of people will look at it skeptically for the the rest of the history of this league, uh, you know, might feel that it's not worth their time to play. I'm thrilled it's coming back, though. I will say that. I'm thrilled we're going to have baseball. I'm thrilled we're going to have a lot of different sports uh, this year because uh, there's an escape factor to them that's so desperately needed, and I love the fact that they're coming back. All right, I got a lot of other things to talk about uh, throughout the show today. Jason Momoa will star as Frosty the Snowman. This is a guy who's played a lot of characters in his career. Frosty, not high up on the list of things that I thought he would ever play, but he will be in a movie, and he will play Frosty. Uh, and I, I can't wait to see how that works out. Uh, there's been a lot of crazy things we've endured throughout 2020. Twitter has been pretty funny about uh, sentences that you never thought would be real that are. So I'll cover some of those. Greg Collins filling in on The Chad Benson Show. This is the Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins. I'm filling in today and thrilled to be with you. Uh, Happy early July 4th to everyone, including Chad Benson, who has a much-deserved early vacation. Uh, I bring in Vince Colonnais every so often on radio because I I love to talk to him. Vince is a guy that that certainly seems to understand a lot of things very well, and yet the way in which he can explain stuff to me when I don't get it is also uh, some of my favorite things that I ever hear. Uh, case in point might be this story that we're about to talk to, Vince. But uh, first, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Greg. Yeah, I'm thrilled to have you on. You are a morning show host at uh, WMAL in D.C. You're also an editor at The Daily Caller. You interviewed John Bolton on your radio show and talked to him about one of the probably most pressing questions anyone can ask of Mr. Bolton right now, whether or not he briefed the president on this Russia bounty intel. Uh, what happened during that conversation? Well, he refused to answer it, and he kind of tried to beg out of it by saying that he can't get into any classified conversations he may or may not have had, which is kind of uh, funny, actually, because 
his entire <laughs> book, he just bypassed the classification process and decided to publish right. it anyway. So his standards shift moment to moment on whether or not he's willing to express things that the government approves. Uh, but this morning when I asked him uh, twice, alongside my co-host, Mary Walter, whether or not he had briefed the president in March of 2019 on the idea that the Russians had established bounties by paying the Taliban to kill Americans. Uh, he dodged on the question, and it's an important one, uh, because the Associated Press reported earlier this week that John Bolton did brief the president last year. They didn't attribute a source to that. Uh, suspicious people might say, maybe that was John Bolton <laughs> that told the Associated right. Press that. But anyway, no, yeah, it was. It, we asked him. He refused to answer. He was a little grumpy that I asked him twice. Uh, so as of this morning, I'm concerned that my home is the next target in John Bolton's next war. Yeah, wow, John Bolton grumpy. I can't possibly uh, uh, imagine that. That's crazy. Uh, I can't believe, though, that he winds up being a, a centerpiece in this story, because obviously the last maybe week or so since the New York Times report, uh, it's been just talked about and talked about whether or not the president knew about this bounty thing. And the fact that yeah. John Bolton might have been one of the people responsible for communicating with him and all the things he said recently about his own feelings for the president and how he interacts with other countries, it is surreal to imagine. And I think I've heard several people on both sides of the aisle say that if the president wasn't told, this would be uh, a huge mistake by those responsible for telling him. And that could be John Bolton. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to unpack with this story and a lot we don't know. First of all, I don't reflexively trust the Intel community or the New York Times anymore. Uh, that's changed thanks to their behavior in both cases uh, over time. And uh, we have seen for the past couple of years a misuse of intelligence for political purposes to try and ruin one guy in particular, Donald Trump. So when you see stories like this, you, you, you have to look at them with a healthy dose of skepticism. The other thing to remember is that with intelligence, there are so many reports about threats and concerns for the United States that come in on a daily basis that only a limited number are ever going to make their way to the desk of the president of the United States. And the reason for that would be that there's something imminent about it or he has to make a decision about it. And the thing we've heard out of the White House is in, in this particular story is that the in intelligence agency didn't actually agree on the threat and whether or not it was real. So um, apparently that, there was enough disagreement that it wasn't verbally briefed to the president of the United States. That's according to the White House. And so, you know, everything here, I think, has to be taken with a heavy uh, uh, dose of skepticism and pause instead of sort of running headlong into the next Trump scandal. Well, the only other thing I want to say about this story is the way in which it would be covered if Obama were the president and a report comes out that the president isn't sure about uh, intelligence. And so he's being cautious in any reaction he has to it and maybe distrusting it. The way in which that's covered years ago would be that he's an incredible person whose patience is, is benefiting our country and who's, you know, forethought and making sure things are accurate is the kind of leader we need. And then when Donald Trump makes a similar decision as the current president of the United States, everyone seems to assume that he's doing horrible, terrible things by by wanting to be sure about something before taking any kind of action at all. It's sort of surreal to me, the difference in that coverage. Yeah, and you don't really have to look for a hypothetical in order to figure it out. I mean, Obama traded five members of the Taliban for Bo Bergdahl, who went back to the battlefield and tried to kill Americans again. So it's like, you know, and, and the press, the press did not treat that with the ferocity or severity that they're treating this story now. So it's, right. like, it's kind of obvious that that there is a double standard and it perpetuates each, each and every day. All the time, every day. I got to ask you about the poll numbers. The president interviewed and talked about it recently. Uh, the poll numbers seem to indicate that a Joe Biden may be doing better than the president in a lot of places, which first to me is, is kind of funny because Joe Biden's uh, plan, I guess, is, as far as campaigns go in 2020, is to be as as remote as possible, as as few appearances as possible, to not speak because apparently that helps him quite a bit. Uh, but do you believe in these poll numbers? Do you think they're relevant to the current conversation as to the, the presidential race? Or do you agree more with the president that kind of like in 2016, they wind up seeming a little less than than valid? Well, I think there's always going to be an underrepresentation of Trump supporters, especially in an environment where people feel like their lives could be destroyed if they admit out loud that they support Donald Trump. So that probably has an impact on the polls. But I don't know if it would actually account for the percentage point spread we're seeing between Biden and Trump. Um, and also look at the fundraising numbers that just came in. Joe Biden, yeah. uh, for the first time, uh, out fundraised uh, Donald Trump, although they both pulled in record hauls. So that's a really important thing. And as you're watching this, 
you know, regardless, you know, if you're a candidate for president, you should always operate like there's a chance you're going to lose. That's how you have a con- contest. And for for the president, uh, his the two, there's two things that have to be done. One is in a world full of chaos. If the house is on fire, for instance, you don't you don't keep telling your wife how much money you made last year to try and make her feel better. better. No, you put the house fire out first. That's your first obligation. So with the country in chaos, from everything from coronavirus to the riots to to things being pulled down or destroyed, Trump's first obligation is to bring peace to our streets and to figure out a way to do that. That's his first obligation. Because when things that are out of control, people kind of choose, you know, maybe I should go with a different guy. And that's a risk for for Donald Trump, whether or not it's fairly deserved. The other thing is, like, he's got to get Joe, he's got to get Joe Biden out there. He's got to have a candidate to run against. And the more Joe Biden hides, the less uh, he's got somebody to pummel. Thank you. That that to me is the, is the huge part in all this is Joe Biden is so non-existent right now as a presidential candidate, which is surreal in and of itself. And he even mentions in the first press conference he gives in a long time that he's going to follow doctor's orders and not appear all that often, not have rallies, not have a lot of uh, public speaking situations and only do a few debates, uh, the minimum amount required. It's surreal to think that a campaign would benefit itself by having uh, Biden speak less. But that is the Joe Biden presidential campaign. And when you compare that to any president, not just Trump having to deal with the the world in which it currently exists in so many ways, of course, there's going to be a lot of reactions and a lot of uh, back and forth as to how the approval numbers and everything else goes. He's dealing with an un, unparalleled amount of issues at the same time. Yes. And in uh, this is so as as of right now, the race is kind of Donald Trump versus generic Democrat. It almost doesn't even matter. <laughs> who the person is who's running because the entire thing is one referendum on Donald Trump. So if you're Trump's campaign, you should be browbeating Joe Biden into submission. You should be like, this guy's crazy. He needs to be out there. He needs to be answering questions. Why isn't he answering questions? And they're trying to do that. They're trying to basically uh, push him into the public as much as they can draw him out. Uh, But that needs to happen. And by the way, they need to like remind people what the stakes are. So even if you're grumpy about Trump or you're uncomfortable or you think he did something wrong, the alternative is Joe Biden is a guy who supports taxpayer funding for abortion. He wants to put Beto O'Rourke, the guy who said he wants to take your AR-15. Hell yes, I'll take your AR-15. He wants to put that guy in charge of gun control policy in the United States. He's he, he already said out loud that the only people he's going to put on the Supreme Court are a list of, of uh, uh, women of color. So he's specifically choosing his next Supreme Court justices based on gender and race rather than merit as an individual measure. So like, if that's what you want, then don't vote for Trump. Like that's kind of, that's, and I I think Trump needs to be forceful in expressing that the stakes are very high. I had a reaction seeing a a poll that 20% of Democrats think that Joe Biden might have uh, dementia. He might have a mental illness. And yet he's still, I can't even fathom that idea that if that were potentially true, which I, I don't think it is. I think, Joe Biden, to me, has always been a guy that is really bad at public speaking, if if not, you know, a foot in the mouth, constantly kind of human. Uh, but the fact that 20 percent of potential supporters of this guy would believe that he's he's mentally struggling with something that should not be the kind of thing that that someone should be running for president while while dealing with is just surreal in and of itself. Let's let's pivot for a second. Jeffrey Epstein back in the news because one of his confidants uh, was arrested. Uh, give us more on that story. Well, I'd hate for us to currently be preparing our Ghislaine Maxwell didn't kill herself headline. Uh, but that that is like, you know, I'm seeing that all over Twitter this morning. Yeah, Ghislaine yeah. Maxwell is uh, his his longtime assistant. And she is the woman who allegedly uh, was responsible for finding and transporting and facilitating all of the underage girls that Jeffrey Epstein was uh, soliciting and abusing through the years. So Ghislaine Maxwell is considered his partner in crime. And it's been there's been, you know, a lot of speculation. First of all, where is Ghislaine Maxwell? You know, we've got somebody's got to get a hold of her. She's the keeper of the keys. She knows all of this stuff. She knows all the powerful people who are around Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, There's a book recently that actually reported uh, uh, that Ghislaine Maxwell was maintaining an affair with Bill Clinton. And that's the reason Clinton was so close to Epstein. He was actually engaging in this long running affair with Ghislaine Maxwell. So there are a lot of secrets that need to be told and that can be told. And Ghislaine Maxwell knows the answers to all of them. So she's been arrested uh, as of this morning. I believe she was arrested in New Hampshire. 
uh, on uh, yeah. several charges of transporting uh, minors for the purpose of sex uh, acts. And uh, that's going to be a big deal. So we'll see. Yeah, absolutely. That is, there's more uh, information, very horrible information probably to come from that story. But it, it is, I saw the same thing on Twitter, uh, people saying, oh my God, I can't believe that she's still with us, which by itself, I don't even understand. I got to ask you this real quick. This is totally a, a pivot in a sense. Uh, whenever anybody tells me about the the deep, dark secrets that could exist in the world, the the conspiracy theories that may be out there. Sure. My brain can almost never fathom them, Vinny. And I think at times I, I turn to people like you to really try to uh, help me know which ones are accurate and which ones aren't. Because, <laughs> and this is just true, this is just selfishly true, I'm such a bad individual at keeping like a, a non-horrible secret. I'm the kind of guy that can't, you know, keep a present secret from one family member to another. So when you start talking about like things to this degree, controversies or, or con- conspiracy, I, my, I mentally check out because I couldn't handle it. I'd be a terrible person to be involved in that stuff. So so how do you take the world that we live in and the amount of conversations that go on like that and then just the the horribleness that is the potential uh, thread that we've pulled today uh, with Ghislaine Maxwell being arrested? Well, get to the bottom of these things so that way we can resolve them and demonstrate that there's actually justice in the world and it's not just reserved for the people who can afford it, right? Yeah. So, uh, in in Ghislaine Maxwell's case, she's she's super rich. She's Jeffrey Epstein's super rich. You know the world the world so far seems to be you know tilted in their favor. And uh, you can't have a justice system that's built like that. Everyone needs to be equal in the eyes of the law. And for that reason, uh, this should be fully vetted. And when you talk about conspiracy theories, um, boy, I detest conspiracy theories because most of the time they're rabbit holes of nonsense. Uh, but <laughs> if you want fewer conspiracy theories in your culture have fewer conspiracies. That's a good way to start. And yeah. when it comes to what happened with Jeffrey Epstein, there's no question that there's already been evidence, tried and convicted in Florida, of uh, a conspiracy to traffic in these young women. And simultaneously, you know, you look around and you talk about the Justice Department and the way that it was corrupted to go out by the Obama administration to go after their Republican opponent, Donald Trump. You start to, you start to become you know, a little skeptical of, of the official storyline, and rightfully so. So you want to fix that in America? Start acting on the up and up all around. I love that message. Uh, you're not running for any kind of office, right, Vinny? No, never. Okay. I, I think that's a great tagline if you ever consider it. Uh, let's start operating on the up and up, Vinny, for 2020, 2024, whatever year you want to want to consider it. I'm down. I want to ask you about NASCAR <laughs> for a second real quick because I saw this uh, yeah. report that one of the drivers will be driving a, a pro-Trump car Uh, The reason this is so interesting to me is not because that's necessarily unexpected in the world of NASCAR, but also the NBA recently talked about allowing players to wear messages on the back of their jerseys instead of wearing their last names. Just fathom a world in which it's not NASCAR, but it's the NBA and a player that wants to support something like the current president of the United States. This story feels utterly different suddenly to me. Uh, But as far as NASCAR is concerned and how much of an honor it is for this player to say that he's he's proud to support this car. I doubt there will be much controversy there. Uh, if you uh, if you think otherwise, let me know. Uh, things are so crazy, Craig. It, it's now gotten to the point where if you stand up for the country, you need to release a statement explaining yourself. So <laughs> there was. Um, did you see the woman who was standing during the national anthem who plays for the Chicago the Chicago Red Stars or something like that? Yes, she's yes, a, the uh, soccer team. Yes, soccer. she. Yeah, she's the, one of the only players on the team standing, and she had to defend the fact that she feels that the the national anthem has value to her. She's from a military family. She had to release a statement explaining why she stood for the national anthem inside of the United States of America. I mean, that's how nuts this has gotten. And that thing about the NBA jerseys, like, what are the limits on that? Like, what is what's that actually going to look like in practice? Is it all just going to be like of a certain ideology, a certain message that's allowed? Or are people going to be able to wear things like free the Uyghurs, which are, by the way, the oppressed Muslim population in China? Are they going to allow are they going to allow to have something that says, free Hong Kong on the back of their jerseys. What about something really simple? And like, you know, two years ago, this wouldn't have been controversial. How about, quote, I love America. Can that appear on the back of a jersey <laughs> in the NBA? Or is that going to actually cause a controversy? It's crazy that as you ask that question, my brain tries to figure it out because the answer should be yes, but it's it's not obvious uh, right now. I'm also wondering no, if someone not. just has a really long message and it's just got to take a lot of that jersey up because that's going to get complicated. I don't know how much space we're allowed to put on there. I know. It, it makes me laugh, too. It makes me remember Remember when the XFL first came out 
And uh, Vince McMahon had basically gotten all these players to come up with their own taglines on the back of their jerseys. Yes. And the one yes. dude who was like the star of the league was called He Hate Me. I remember. That was amazing. <laughs> I got to let you go, man. I'm thrilled to have you on. As always, thrilled to talk all these things with you. Vince Colonnese, you are a host on WMAL, The Mall in the Mornings in Washington, D.C. You're also an editor at The Daily Caller and a talker of a lot of sense that I love to talk to as much as I can. Thanks for joining the show. Thanks, Craig. All right. Talk to you soon. It's a quick break. A lot more. Craig Collins filling in on The Chad Benson Show. The Chad Benson Show, where we reach across the aisle and occasionally poke someone in the eye. Craig Collins filling in on the Chad Benson Show. Chad is back with you next week. Early vacation for him. Much deserved. Uh, thanks again to Vince Colonnese from WMAL, The Mall, and from uh, The Daily Caller for jumping in and, and helping me digest a lot of the crazy stories that exist within the news. I, I like to throw a crazy question at him, uh, one silly one. To end all the interviews. I didn't have a chance to do it today, uh, but I wanted to know what he thought of Jason Momoa, who is confirmed to star in a live action Frosty the Snowman movie. Uh, Vince tells me via text, perfect casting. Uh, I'm intrigued to see how that's going to go. Craig Collins, as I said, filling in on the Chad Benson Show. More coming up. The Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. I am hosting for today. My name is Craig Collins. Thrilled to be with you. Uh, Let's kick off with some audio from the president speaking about job numbers, speaking about all kinds of stuff, and also a projection for the third quarter. I said you're going to have a fantastic third quarter. It'll be a third quarter the likes of which nobody has ever seen before, in my opinion. And the good thing is the numbers will be coming out just prior to the election, so people will be able to see those numbers. The fourth quarter, likewise, will be extremely good. And maybe most importantly, from the standpoint of our country itself, next year will be a historic year. Next year is going to be an incredible year for jobs, for companies, for growth. Things are happening like nobody would have thought possible. It's very interesting to hear the president start to ride in, uh, dive into these job numbers, to dive into the success in the economy uh, currently. That is, in and of itself, sort of a surreal sentence, as we had all the things we had um, through the coronavirus and its response uh, hit our economy as hard as it did. The fact that Wall Street looks to be doing relatively well uh, is, is certainly a success, and a success that has led a lot of times for the uh, president throughout his, his first few years in office and something that I think will win over a lot of voters again when you decide who is is most trustworthy with the economy moving forward, who is going to be better at keeping us afloat and keeping us succeeding and creating jobs uh, between the two candidates. One that doesn't seem to even be willing to have conversations in general uh, that seems to understand that his campaign, uh, Joe Biden's campaign, is benefited by him not talking <laughs> uh, or speaking as little as possible. And President Trump, who is facing a an untold amount of challenges, and in a lot of ways, in in certainly the ways that involve the economy, handling them to a degree that is as as good as can possibly be asked for. Uh, he closed this press conference though by declining to give any any sort of uh, question and answer sh- session to reporters, which I thought was interesting. He made one last statement, and then he just simply walked away. Here's what that sounded like. So I want to thank everybody for being here today. These are historic numbers in a time that uh, a lot of people would have wilted. They would have wilted, but we didn't wilt, and our country didn't wilt, and I'm very honored to be your president. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions start getting lobbed his way, and he's, uh, he's done. He's out. And you probably will see a lot of that. You will see very few of these statements wind up getting fielded uh, by the press and having additional questions and reactions because the way in which this conversation happens Every time the president speaks with the press is is just utterly different than the way it occurs with any other politician. It's just it's the the challenge that exists there is I don't even know how you resolve it, what ways you fix it. Uh, But that that is the situation. Uh, Almost five million jobs created, by the way, 
uh, huge numbers, uh, huge, I should say, uh, huge uh, numbers that we haven't seen ever. Um, and certainly the second month in a row in which that's been true and shocked a lot of analysts as far as the amount created. I will say as a caveat to that, that uh, some of the jobs getting created, for lack of a better word, are probably ones that are being given back to people who lost them. Uh, but that's irrelevant. These are people who were for a while unemployed and now uh, gainfully employed again. And these numbers will probably continue to trend up. And as the president said, be a part of the conversation uh, moving forward. It is it is not a time, I think, in which it makes a lot of sense to add restrictions to our business world. And out of the two presidents, who do you think is more likely to do things that benefit our economy and less likely to benefit our economy? I think that's the easiest question to answer at any of them. I also have uh, a follow up on the appeals court ruling in New York about the Mary Trump tell all book. That is President Donald Trump's niece. Uh, It was prevented uh, one day, or at least there was a restraining order placed on this book saying that that it did appear that there could be a case here. And the case would be in breaking a a agreement, an agreement that exists after the passing of Mary Trump's father, uh, Fred Trump, that would prevent her from doing things like exposing a a bunch of secrets uh, in the uh, appeals court ruling. That is not necessarily true. And so the book has not been suspended anymore. Mary is not allowed to do anything. She's not allowed to to act in uh, in benefit to the book. She's not allowed, as of right now, to to be an agent that even distributes the book at all. Uh, but the ruling in New York says that the publisher of the book, Simon & Schuster, is not necessarily an agent. And also the fact that they already sent 75,000 copies uh, around to bookstores and people throughout the, the United States or wherever uh, means that it's pretty hard to put this uh, uh, cork back on the bottle, uh, which is exactly the same thing that actually happened during the John Bolton book, the, the most recent tell-all. I don't know how many tell-alls we'll see. I would love an over-under people betting on the total amount of tell-all books that exist within the presidential uh, uh, a run here, within uh, uh, Donald Trump's run as president of our country, because right now it's, it's quite a few. And if he gets reelected, it might be a bunch more. But tell-all books seem to be like the jam. And as I've said before, uh, and I find it tremendously interesting, I don't know how much proof you need in a tell-all book right now. If you title it something, and if actually the court... Uh, case that exists and the the president's family, the Trump family, says things like there's no amount of money that could undo the damage that this book would cause. That's that's a bestseller right there. Uh, John Bolton's book is a bestseller. So we'll continue to see those absolutely be a thing that is just sort of uh, a, bri- a byproduct, I guess, of the appetite, as I said, of so many, not just our our press, but honestly, uh, a lot of Americans to to hear as many negative things as possible. Uh, as far as the president of the United States goes. I like something that's going on on Twitter. It's it's viral, and I think it's it's interesting. At times, I think it's kind of funny. Uh, they say that comedy is tragedy plus time, so maybe uh, it's a little too soon to laugh at some of the, the world in which we've experienced over the last few months, and yet Twitter is doing a really good job of at least writing a lot of sentences that you never thought would be true. These are sentences that, at 2019, if you thought anyone would ever say them, uh, you'd be like, no, that's there's no way that that could possibly ever happen. How could that even become a common sentence? And my favorite one out of all of them is one that really demonstrates the issue that might exist as far as masks are concerned. Although uh, the president and several people have come forward saying that masks are OK, they should be worn. They have no problem with them. And I agree with that, too. And yet a sentence that you'll hear people say is, oh, that guy was turned away from walking into the bank because he wasn't wearing a mask in 2019 or any other time in our lives. If you're in a bank and you see somebody approaching mask on, that is a situation you immediately want to be out of. And yet right now, this year, it's the exact opposite. We need to make sure the face is shielded when someone goes into a place like the bank that is completely fine. Uh, but you'll find a bunch of those viral on social media, and I think they're tremendously interesting. Since I mentioned it, um, I will take a second and go ahead and play some audio from the president as well as far as masks are concerned. Uh, this has been a huge, other a uh, huge, I keep using that word, other conversation going on as far as the president and what he does and doesn't support and certainly a way in which people have criticized him. Uh, the president does not feel that masks are inappropriate. He does think you should do what you feel is is best to do. And he said so uh, in a recent interview. Here is that conversation. Mr. President, uh, before I let you go, the, the everything seems to be political now. You know, we, we talk about masks. Uh, you can see this. Uh, yeah, really nice. It's good. Trump, I like it. It's really nice. Trump it's nice. Will you consider wearing a mask? And if not, how come? Well, I've already had masks, and I've worn a mask. And if I'm near people, you know, you were tested, right, just now. And everybody that's around me as president gets tested. That's, like, standard. 
Uh, and I'm also, I keep distances. I'm, you know, supposed to keep a distance, and I keep distances. But if I needed a mask, if I was in a crowd, a, you know, a crowd, a lot of people and everything else, I'd wear them. I have no problem with a mask at all. And I tell people, but I have a different kind of a life. Being president, you have a little bit of a different life. You're not that often. I don't think it makes sense when you walk up. I see Biden walking up on a stage where there's nobody around and the audience is 25, 30, 40 feet away. Not too much of an audience either, by the way. <laughs> and he's speaking, and he has a mask on. And you can't even understand what he's saying, or he takes it off up there. I do. I agree with that. I, I like everything about this statement, actually. To be honest, I like the fact that at first the president says not only has he worn a mask and has masks, but that he has no problem with them. And then he references what you see a lot of times from politicians and people that seem to just be trying to make a political statement wearing a mask on television by wearing it at times that it's not necessary. If you're enough feet away from everyone, especially if you're outdoors, you don't need to be rocking a mask and giving a speech through it uh, when people are 25 to 30 feet from you. It just isn't necessary, doesn't make sense, and feels way different than, I guess, someone who's wearing one to protect themselves. But I like the fact that the president is out there and speaking about this and doing it in a way that I think will be uh, a good news to a lot of Americans on both sides of the aisle who feel that this is an important step we need to take. Mitch McConnell, other individuals on the Republican side of the aisle have also thrown support behind this idea. And I know there's probably still people with feelings all over the place on this. But just to, to end it, here's what the president thinks as far as what you should or shouldn't do. As with a lot of things in this country, it should be up to you. When there's nobody around, I don't see any reason to be wearing it. But no, I have no objection to masks whatsoever. Do what you're supposed to do. And also do what makes you feel good. Do what makes you feel good. Do what makes sense to you is a very, very powerful message and one that I think should be delivered. Uh, and at the same time, do what the people recommend that you do, what the uh, health care and health departments in your areas recommend you do. Seems to be the easiest of advice to give and tremendous advice to hear, uh, even from our, our president, who at times, yes, uh, was at least a little bit less forthcoming in his feelings on it. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. Uh, a lot more in store for you in just a bit. Get over it. It's time to forge a new path with your very own political cartographer, Chad. This is the Chad Benson Show. I am your host today, Craig Collins. Glad to be here. Happy almost July 4th to uh, many people out there. Uh, I want to talk about another petition that uh, calls for the replacing of a statue. And I really feel like somebody's trolling us. I feel like this can't be legitimate. There was one about Flavortown being the name of a place. Uh, I think Columbus, Ohio, actually. And that was after uh, Guy Fieri. <laughs> you wanted to rename Columbus, Ohio to Flavortown. Now there's a push for another area uh, that exists. This is in, in Cleveland that I guess uh, has Christopher Columbus. There's a statue of Christopher Columbus there. And this is in a place that's considered the Little Italy neighborhood of, of Cleveland. Uh, there is a change.org appeal to, to change that statue to one of Chef Boyardee. That's right, Chef Boyardee, who, by the way, uh, when I read through this appeal and I thought, of course, this has to be trolling, uh, actually is a pretty interesting human. Uh, Chef Boyardee is someone who came here from Italy, uh, obviously became very popular and inevitably canned up a bunch of his food and sauce, which was tremendously popular. He gave it to, to soldiers during World War II. Really cool guy in a lot of stay, in a lot of ways, but certainly not someone that a lot of current Italians would point to as, as an appropriate statue in a place like Little Italy. And I'm not besmirching the actual human that is Chef Boyardee, but the product that currently exists in the world is one that not many, uh, not many people like myself, not many Italian-Americans would ever highlight as a product that we're proud of uh, and that exists in the world. Have I had it before? Of course I had. Does uh, Chef Boyardee right now need a statue uh, put up in his honor to talk about the uh, sauce and certainly in a place like Little Italy? Can you picture this happening in a bigger uh, uh, Italian uh, community, somewhere like in New York, let's say, if they try to put up a statue a Chef Boyardee, I think that would make a lot more people mad than happy. But this is real. Uh, thousands of people have signed the petition asking for it to be taken down. And now to quote from the claim, from the petition, here is the pitch. If you want to consider being a part of this uh, ridiculous, in my opinion, 
uh, call to action. Columbus is not someone we should celebrate. I'm quoting the plea within this uh, this change.org post. He was a racist monster who initiated the genocide against indigenous Americans. That is uh, a whole part of it. Immigrant success stories who enrich our community with food and an iconic mustache are much better, uh, apparently, according to this post. Chef Boyardee, I mean, come on. If we had to pick a bunch of people who are, and I, I guess maybe wrongfully so in the case of Chef Boyardee, but respected more than him, I think there's a lot of people that might be on that list. And I, I can't imagine, are there any other places in our country that have statues of this guy? Or is this absolutely 100% a joke? I, I can't tell, but it's been signed quite a few times. And if you read into the literature on it, the, the person seems to be genuine and serious. And that's just the world in which we currently live. Let's change an, an iconic statue in any part of our country to one of a guy on a food product, uh, a can for a food product, because his mustache is, quote, iconic. I, I am amused. I will say that. Uh, but I also think that this is uh, is utterly ridiculous. And part of the, the just confusing thing that is waking up every single day and reading any and all headlines, uh, including this one, actually, Jim Carrey has written a, a fictional book. He's made up a bunch of things in something that he's calling the Memoirs and Misinformation Book. He's also created fictional characterizations of several celebrities he knows. My favorite is not necessarily the one in the headline of the story I found, but the fact that Nick Cage is going to be in his book. There's a fictional version of Nick Cage, and he's, by the way, uh, the actor Nick Cage, honored to be in it, I guess, having no idea that Jim Carrey wrote it. But I, I can't imagine what you make up about a Nicolas Cage that isn't already somehow probably a fact. Uh, but the reason that I guess this story that that Jim Carrey is trending in the news right now for a, a book he's writing is because he thinks Tom Cruise is going to want to fight him. Uh, Tom Cruise is another person who has a fictional version of himself represented in the book. And I guess for legal reasons, Jim Carrey even changed the names of these individuals. Tom Cruise's character is named Laser Jack Lightning, which is odd and interesting in and of itself. This is not a book I'm reading, by the way. And Jim Carrey is certainly a guy that has changed a lot over the years from a a comedian and a, a public actor person to an artist and political uh, human for sure. But it's this is the oddest thing that I've also read today. These are two of the oddest stories I've read, that there's a petition in Cleveland asking for a Christopher Columbus statue to be turned into a Chef Boyardee statue, and that's in sincerity, and that Jim Carrey wrote a book about fake people who are based on real people, and people are excited to read this book. It makes it makes no sense. I don't. I have no way to fathom or understand the world in which we live. And I need your help every day, every time that I look into these things to understand how any of this stuff can be real or accurate. Uh, there also is this, actually, this is just a, a dumb person in the news. And, and there's a lot of dumb people every day. And I take a great joy at times in talking about them. A 22 year old guy from Alaska broke into a fire station over the weekend, stole a fire truck and then crashed it through the front door. He then drove it straight to a bar and was arrested at the bar. So 22 years old, I don't know if he just needed, you know, a lift somewhere, if he couldn't get an Uber in the area. He does live in Alaska. His decision, steal fire truck, break fire truck by crashing it through the garage door at the fire station, drive it to a bar and park it outside. Uh, he is in the middle of nowhere, by the way, 300 miles from anywhere uh, valuable in Alaska, including Anchorage. So the first thought of many is that he maybe needed it for some sort of emergency. Nah, the guy just needed a drink. He's facing charges of burglary, vehicle theft, and criminal mischief, plus a charge for violating his release from a previous DUI he got a few weeks ago. So this, I, I, there's two stories in the news that are actual headlines that to me would be more ridiculous than some of the, the other things that exist in the world, but yet they, they aren't. Guy steals fire truck, drives it to bar, and then gets obviously arrested. I mean, can you envision that? Driving by the bar and seeing a, a busted fire truck sitting outside the front of it? And then the dude in Minnesota who got naked and climbed into the sewer because reasons, I guess. I don't know why. And then he he wound up being chased by, by law enforcement officials, by first responders, by people in that area, and he got away. He just sort of disappeared, and everyone's going to let him get away because there's got to be no situation in which you wanted to interact with these people. I mean, this is... This is crazy. Oh, by the way, the guy in Alaska, he also got arrested back in 2017 for stealing a different vehicle, which was also a fire truck. Apparently, this guy just thinks he's playing Grand Theft Auto the game in real life. His name is Dawson Porter. I need to look up a, a mugshot of this guy. I need to know what he looks like now. But Dawson Porter just apparently seems to think that any and all fire trucks 
are his for his doing. There's actually a, a GoFundMe page. By the way, my favorite part of the story, trying to get him out, trying to bail him out because they think he's innocent. What? Greg Collins, this has been the Chad Benson Show. This is the Chad Benson Show.